everyone. Uh, would somebody mind just typing me a message to confirm that you can actually hear me, please? Thank you, Martin and Richard. That's a great comfort. Um, well, it's 8 a.m. my time, which I think probably means it's uh, late afternoon for most, most of you, so we might make a start. Welcome, everyone, in whatever time zone you're located, and thank you for joining me. As the slide says, I'm the Geometallurgy Practice Leader for AMC Consultants, and my primary training is as a geologist, so my career has been in resource geology, mining geology, geometallurgy, and a little bit of exploration at the start of my career. In this presentation, I'm going to look at how we can use resource drilling more effectively to gain leverage from traditional metallurgical test work and provide greater confidence for investment decisions. Once we have that first discovery drill hole, we need to start thinking about characterizing how the mineralization we've discovered is going to behave in a mineral processing plant. I'm going to start off by talking about why thinking ahead and making geometallurgy and metallurgy part of your plans is important. And then we'll have a look at some aspects of data collection for geometallurgy, metallurgical sample selection. Um, and while we look at that sample selection part, we'll also see how you might use some of the data that you've already collected. So why is this a big deal? Isn't mineral processing something that the metallurgists deal with? Yes, but they need help from geologists. Recovery of mineral pro products from mining operations is governed by, amongst other things, three axioms. The first one is that the chain of production from blasting to recovery of mineral concentrate is dependent on the characteristics of the ore. Secondly, only a tiny fraction of the ore will be tested before it's mined. And thirdly, ore bodies are intrinsically variable. So it follows that mining and ore processing systems are designed and will be operated in an environment of ore, ore body uncertainty. Unfortunately, the intrinsic variability of ore bodies and the paucity of metallurgical testing is often not understood or is ignored until late in the project development cycle. Simplistically, we can think of the impact of uncertainty in mining operations in a couple of ways. So firstly, it costs money in the sense that it leads to incorrect decisions at all scales from short-term tactical decisions to long-term strategic decisions. For example, if we consider a truckload of ore, if the estimated characteristics of the ore are exactly the same as the actual characteristics of the ore in the truck, then the correct decision about where to send the truck will be made every time. But uncertainty in the estimates means that predicted and actual are rarely identical. So many trucks will be sent to the wrong destination. For example, this might mean that ore that should go to the heap leach is incorrectly sent to flotation. And these losses are not recoverable. Secondly, Uncertainty in the ore body leads to mismatches between plant operating settings and the characteristics of the ore feed. Even with the best uh, plant control systems, correct settings may continuously lag the presentation of the ore. Again, the losses are not recoverable. And this is true whether we're looking at mill throughput, reagent consumption, power consumption, or mineral recovery. In process plant design, uncertainty about ore characteristics can also lead to suboptimal design decisions, incorrect estimation of operating costs, revenues, and ultimately of project value. To illustrate the point, we can consider two common processes in mineral processing. Crushing and grinding processes are controlled by what might be broadly termed rock strength. This includes hardness, brittleness, and the degree to which these properties might be anisotropic. These characteristics directly affect energy consumption, throughput, and wear rates. Similarly with flotation, all properties such as sulfide species, 
the presence of clays, talc, graphite, grain size and texture of the ore will all likely impact recovery, reagent consumption and concentrate quality. The bottom line is that these impacts affect capital costs, operating costs, revenues and possibly all three. Traditionally, ore was characterized primarily by a small number of metallurgical tests carried out on drill core samples. But metallurgical tests like these are labor intensive, slow and consequently expensive. In the table here, I've just put in uh, four common metallurgical test processes with a rough sort of uh, guide to cost. And as you can see, many of the tests are up in the thousands of dollars for single samples. By contrast, many different types of geological data can be gathered from resource drill hole samples at relatively low cost or perhaps for no cost at all. By recognizing this at the time of discovery, we can design data collection and adjust exploration workflows in order to get maximum value from our drilling programs. Before I go further, I should probably define what I mean by geometallurgy, things we're going to be talking about that a fair bit. There's no agreed formal definition, but this one on the left illustrates the scope of the inputs and output from the geometallurgical process. So this definition talks about the integration of geological, geotechnical, mining, metallurgical, environmental and economic information to help maximize the value of an ore body while minimizing technical and operational risk. This is AMC's definition of what that means in practical terms. So AMC combines ore body knowledge and data science to deliver predictive models that improve estimates of ore processing characteristics and reduce ore body uncertainty. So our approach is focused on getting leverage from the low cost data gathered in the course of developing ore body knowledge. Geometallurgy is not a new science and it's not simply geologists talking to metallurgists. It's more the practice of looking at a project through a lens that is focused on how to understand and predict how the geology of the ore body will translate into ore processing response. With this approach, we can make sure that we collect the right data from the outset and we don't waste early opportunities to build ore body knowledge. We want to be able to predict the behavior of the ore in the process plant, but those behavior characteristics can't be measured directly from the drill core. We can take throughput as an example. This is obviously very important for uh, plant design and for the economics um, of a deposit. Traditionally, throughput has been estimated from parameters obtained from bond work index tests or drop weight tests. And as we saw in the earlier table, these tests are very expensive. So we can't carry, uh, carry out thousands of bond work index tests or drop weight tests on our drill core. The geometallurgical approach is to seek an estimate of throughput from a proxy which can be easily measured in large numbers and at low cost. When we consider throughput, we can think of many variables either alone or in combination that might have potential to form a useful proxy, including the ones in this list. So rock type, alteration, rock quality designation, density, mineral content, silica content, hardness, uh, and measures of rock strength, such as we might get from point load index. We can imagine that all those characteristics might uh, influence the throughput through the mill. And I've ranked them there in terms of increasing cost. This is the sort of data that we can collect from our drill core. Drill core is usually our best source of geometallurgical data. Typically, we have many thousands of meters of drill core spread across the entire deposit. Core provides the greatest amount of detailed geological information, such as rock type, alteration, grain size, texture, and a variety of geotechnical parameters that are 
commonly measured um, in exploration and resource development pr programs such as RQD, fracture frequency, rock mass rating, and of course, density. Even though much of this information is qualitative, if it is collected with a high degree of control and guidance, it can still be very useful for predicting metallurgical behavior. All data should be collected in strictly numeric or coded form, but there's always the option to capture additional freeform descriptions, and this may be particularly useful for building up the bigger picture and understanding exploration targets. The key to data collection is to maintain consistency, and I know this can be a significant challenge over the life of a project. As well as descriptive logging, there are various tests that we can easily apply to drill core before it's sent for assaying. We'll look briefly at strength testing, bulk density testing, and spectral logging. What we mean by strength is difficult to define. And it's important to bear in mind that strength tests measure the response of a sample to a specific set of equipment and test conditions. So different strength tests are not simply alternative methods for measuring the same thing. And that means that their results may not be directly comparable. The point load test is a simple test with low cost equipment. The sample is compressed between two steel platens and the pressure at which failure occurs is measured. It's easy to execute on an exploration site, but it's relatively slow so it tends to be used at widely spaced intervals down the drill holes. Point load tests are a favorite choice of geotechnical engineers, and so point load data may already be being collected. It may therefore be a free source of geometallurgical data. Point load index, which is the, uh, the measure derived from the test, is often considered to be a measure from which comminution behavior and process plant throughput can be predicted. And so it's also favored by plant design engineers. Personally, I'm cautious about point load tests because the repeatability of measurements on adjacent pieces of core can be very poor. So the data is often plagued by high amounts of random error. An alternative to the point load test is the use of the Equo Tip and Schmidt Hammer hardness testers. These are small portable devices that can be used to collect large quantities of closely spaced data without damaging the core. They measure the impelled and rebound velocities of a spring loaded mass impacting against the surface of the sample. The ratio of the velocities provides a measure of the strength or hardness of the sample. Whilst they only test a small volume of drill core around the test point, Robust results can be built up by close spaced measurements. The two instruments are slightly different. The Schmidt hammer has a larger impact force and it needs a larger sample. So rock specimens or possibly something like PQ core, maybe HQ. The equo tip imparts a smaller force. So it's suitable for smaller core and can certainly be used down to HQ and NQ size. Interestingly, the Schmidt and Equo tip results may only be weakly correlated. And this appears to be because the Schmidt provides a more penetrative measure through the mass of the sample, whereas the Equo tip measures are very much superficial uh, and closer to, to grain scale measurements. Nonetheless, they can both be very useful. Bulk density is controlled by mineral content and porosity. And so it's not surprising that geometallurgy studies often demonstrate that bulk density is useful for predicting the response of ore to comminution or even to other extractive processes. This is another good free data type to collect because it should already be on the agenda for resource estimation. Key things to watch out for when considering density uh, measurements and density data are firstly the physical characteristics of the samples and how they will constrain the range of measurement techniques that will be feasible. The measurement methods themselves, and we're fortunate that we have several alternatives 
many variations on a theme from which we can choose. And then thirdly, quality control and quality assurance, making sure that we put in place procedures and checks to reduce risk and meet the requirements of international reporting codes. There are several different methods available to exploration or resource geologists for measuring bulk density. To select the most appropriate method, you have to look at the rocks that you are dealing with and ask questions such as, is the core incompetent sticks? Is the core porous or vuggy? Does it contain clays or other minerals that will rapidly absorb water? Is the mineralization relatively homogeneous? or is it heterogeneous? And what is the moisture content of the core in its current state? The reference paper that I've put at the bottom of the slide deals with these questions and provides procedures for many density me measurement methods that you can consider. It's available through the OSIMM and CIM websites, but if you have trouble finding a copy, let me know and I'll see if I can help. One of the biggest traps to watch out for when measuring density is sampling bias. This example of a core tray from a manganese deposit illustrates the challenges of alternating competent and friable materials, dense and less dense material. In this situation, if we use a method that is based on short lengths of core, it is almost inevitable that we will select the more competent pieces of core for our measurement. And this almost always results in bias towards the more dense material. This problem is illustrated by this plot of dry bulk density um, data from a nickel laterite deposit. And it compares full core versus short samples of core. The horizontal axis shows continuous core results and the vertical axis shows the results from small subsamples of core the typical 20 centimeter stick of core that is used with Archimedean methods. The small samples are clearly biased compared to the measurement on the continuous core samples. So in this case, the measurement of short samples was abandoned and, and alternative methods based on whole core were adopted for the remainder of the study. Handheld multispectral scanners have become commonplace in core farms and provide an excellent source of semi-quantitative or even quantitative data uh, of mineral content. The automated robotic scanners, such as Highlogger and CoreScan, provide very dense, spatially continuous data that is very objective in the sense that it operates the same way day in, day out. Spectral loggers can see some minerals that are very hard to recognize with the naked eye especially clays and other phyllosilicate minerals in low proportions. They're somewhat limited in that they primarily scan the surface of the core, so there may be some inaccuracy with the mineral content of the full volume of the core. But they can also be used on percussion drill hole chips from exploration or blast holes, and they are a really excellent source of information to inform geometallurgical studies. Hyperspectral loggers can be valuable for providing measurements of a range of minerals that may directly influence metallurgical behavior of the ore, such as detailed clay mineralogy, uh, identifying kaolinite, dikite, smectite, and various swelling clays, talc, carbonates, and sulfates. They may also identify specific mineralizing events more accurately than the human eye, and therefore they may help to refine the qualitative visual logs of alteration types. After the initial cost of purchase, use of handheld loggers is a low cost activity that is easily integrated with geological logging procedures. The larger automated units are now available as fully containerized systems that can be hired for major projects. So returning to our tray of drill core, a fully fledged geometallurgical, geometallurgically oriented process for handling the core could look something like this uh, flow diagram. 
So firstly, we might mark out the core in the usual manner, um, uh, orient, putting on the orientation line, the sampling intervals, et cetera. Um, then carry out the geotechnical logging, measuring core recovery, RQD, and fracture frequency. Ideally, we would carry out the geotechnical logging before we got the material to the core farm. We would carry out, carry out the logging in the splits at the drill site to get better quality data. But in many cases, that's not practical. And the first geotechnical logging will actually happen at the exploration camp or the core farm. If we have uh, magnetic minerals such as magnetite or pyrotite in association with ore, uh, we might use a, a magnetic susceptibility log. We might take PX portable XRF measurements to get an initial measurement of grades. We might then use spectral scanners, either the handheld or the, uh, the larger automated ones, log the geology, keep a good photographic record of the core, measure the bulk density of the samples with an appropriate method, then sample the core. And in my experience, measuring the halfness of the hard core with the equotip is, is often a convenient time to uh, insert the hardness measurement into that workflow. By collecting data for a wide range of chemi geochemical, mineralogical, and physical characteristics, we can then search to find proxies for process response characteristics. However, it's important to recognize that to combine these different data types for data analysis, we must ensure that they're collected over comparable intervals. In a highly variable ore body, it's no use having two meter assay intervals but density measured using a 10 centimeter stick of core. Similarly, it's wasteful if there is no consistency to the elements that are assayed in different batches of samples. Missing data can, be seriously, can seriously hamper attempts to develop useful predictive relationships. So if you've decided that uh, there are nine elements in your assay suite that are particularly relevant to the um, geology and the potential response of the ore, then my recommendation is that you apply those uh, assays consistently. I'll present a very short case study um, illustrating some of these points from the Bowden Silver Lead Zinc Project in New South Wales, Australia. It illustrates what can be achieved uh, when you collect ge good geometallurgical data and can then join it with metallurgical uh, test results. So Bowden's is a silver lead zinc deposit formed in a sequence of hydrothermally altered volcanic rocks. As part of an earlier pre-feasibility study, comminution test work had been carried out using drill core samples. 14 half core samples had been used for comminution testing to measure bond rod work index and bond ball work index. And the remaining half core was stored in a shed in good condition. The drill hole database contained multi-element ICP data. We carried out an orientation survey of almost 1200 meters of core with an equo tip hardness tester, collecting readings at two and a half centimeter intervals. This may seem a lot, but the measurements only take a few seconds to complete. And it's quite possible to log several hundred meters uh, in a single day. After compositing the equo tip data to match the metallurgical sample intervals, the data were joined. The bond work index test demonstrated a range of hardness characteristics from soft to moderately hard within each of the main rock types. The mean equo tip hardness results correlated strongly with the bond work index, allowing bond work index to predict, be predicted from the equo tip data for each meter of drill core. So that gives us immediately leverage on the 1200 meters of equo tip that, uh, of core that were logged with the equo tip. When the 1200 predicted bond work index values were compared to the geochemistry, we saw a correlation between bond work index and sodium. Initial indications were that the sodium depletion was associated with hydrothermal alteration. 
that opens up the possibility now of getting leverage from the full 12,500 sodium assays already in the database. So I think this is a, a good example showing how to get leverage um, from low cost geometallurgical data and predictive modeling. In this case, our predictive model was just a simple exponential model. Moving on to metallurgical sampling, in most cases, drill core will be the primary source of material for metallurgical sample testing. Sample selection needs to be considered from both the minerals processing and the geological perspectives. Sample selection is the joint responsibility of the geologist and the metallurgist. The engagement between the two should be collaborative, inquiring and iterative. The metallurgist brings expertise in minerals processing and metallurgical test work procedures. The geologist brings in-depth knowledge of the ore body, its grades, rock types, mineral assemblages, textures and spatial disposition. The metallurgist knows how the samples should be tested, how much material is required and what characteristics are likely to be important for the unit processes in the likely processing flow sheets. The geologist knows how the chemical, mineral and physical characteristics vary across the deposit. Jointly, they can determine what parts of the deposit need to be tested. Mining engineer also has a role and can provide important input to sample selection, bringing understanding of the potential stages in which the mine may be developed and the sequence in which ore types may be delivered to the process plant. For a new discovery, the first thing to do is to confirm that there is a feasible way to process the ore. All samples will be tested using a range of crushing, grinding and extraction processes, such as flotation, to establish the basic flow sheet and test work regime. For this initial stage of the project, large composited samples are typically chosen to represent a blend of the major ore types or a time blend that represents nominated production periods. In particular, the first few years of production are often targeted because they have the greatest impact on project value. In these cases, sample selection from drill cores will likely focus on intervals of the major ore types with apparently average characteristics from locations dictated by the mine schedule. Typically, the composites, composites will be made up of core from multiple drill holes and maybe several hundred kilograms in weight. These tests will provide the first indications of technical feasibility and economic viability of ore processing. The major limitation with blended composites of this type is that they do little to increase the understanding of ore response and recovery on a practical short-term scale of days or weeks. Short scale fluctuations in ore fed to the plant can have a large impact on mineral recovery and plant re performance. If a process plant has been designed with tolerances that are too narrow to cope with the variations in ore feed characteristics, excess load may build up, reagent consumption may increase, slurry rheology may change, energy consumption may increase, and the tailings grades may increase. And as we saw at the very beginning of my talk, these losses can't be retrieved. Variability sampling is designed to identify any problematic ore types and to determine the range of responses that the process plant will need to be able to handle. Designing for the extreme ore types is generally impractical, uneconomic and usually made unnecessary by good ore control and blending practices. So in most cases, the process design engineers will design the plant to run optimally on an average run of mine feed, but with sufficient flexibility to handle perhaps the 75th percentile of the ore. Circuits may also be designed for ease of reconfiguration on the strength of geometallurgical data and good mine planning. Significant capital expenditure can be saved by making provision in the initial plant layout for additional crushing, grinding or processing equipment that will be needed later in the project when new ore types enter the feed blend. 
The samples for variability tests should be selected from continuous intervals of core from individual holes. The spatial location of every variability sample is therefore known, and that's a vital first step in identifying spatial variability within an ore body. As far as possible, considering all the available lithological, mineralogical, geochemical, physical, and textural information, each variability sample should be comprised of a single ore type. Several variability sampling samples representing each ore type should be tested to determine, how to determine how consistently the ore type responds to testing. This is necessary because microscopic mineralogical or textural features that affect liberation and recovery may only become apparent after metallurgical testing. That is, they all may look the same when you're looking at it as a geologist in the core trays, but you may find um, that there are differences in its response when you actually put it through testing. The variability test work program will produce information on all processing behavior that can be joined to the geological and geometallurgical data we've collected and can be located in 3D. For convenience, when selecting metallurgical samples, we often consider deposits in terms of ore types, which we might define as a class of mineralized material perceived to have relatively consistent responses to ore processing. And we also tend to talk about domains, which add a spatial location to the concept of ore type. Classification of material into ore types may be based on simple grade ranges, but if you have multivariate data, then you may need more detailed data analysis to make sense of the complex data. If we've gathered a useful suite of multivariate geometallurgical data, we can use machine learning to define the domains and help to guide the metallurgical sampling. Here's an example of how machine learning can be used to define domains. It's not practical to visualize domains in high dimensional terms. So to explain what I mean by high dimensional terms, for example, if the domain is defined by a combination of copper, silver, rock type, alteration code and density, that's five different variables, how can we display that, how can we show that in our normal three-dimensional world? The answer is to apply dimension reduction techniques to transform the high dimensional data to a more convenient two-dimensional space. The data transformation that you make may be linear, as in principal components analysis, and many of you will be familiar with PCA, but there are also many useful non-linear dimension reduction techniques available. In this case, in the, one, the slide I have here, we've used an algorithm called UMAP to represent the multivariate data for each drill hole sample in two UMAP coordinates. In the first plot on the left, we see all of the drill hole data plotted in this UMAP space. The UMAP coordinates are derived from the assays, the bond work index, and gold and copper recoveries in this instance. Points that are closer together are more similar in a multivariate sense than those that are far apart in this plot. The color in this first plot simply represents the density of the data points, how much data we have in a particular area on the plot. We can see that the samples form several clusters. Some of these we can easily separate by eye, but other parts of the plot, there is a less clear distinction between the groups. So in diagram number two, we used a machine learning technique to define the clusters or the domains for us. And in this case, the machine learning technique has identified seven clusters and they're colored separately uh, and divided into those polygons. If we're happy with the definition of the clusters, we can use machine learning to build a classification model and apply it to the drill hole database. And on the right, we can see the classification model that was used in this case, uh, which happens to be based on using a decision tree. 
Here's the same data as we saw on the previous slide, again plotted in UMAP coordinates, but now the data points are colored by various grades and all processing responses, which have previously been estimated from the dual hole data using regression models. So as we look across the four diagrams, we can see that the multidimensional characteristics of the data are captured in that 2D UMAP space, and we can still interpret the relationships between the different variables. So for example, we can clearly see the correlation between copper and sulfur grades. We can use diagrams like this to decide whether all ore types have been adequately tested in our metallurgical test program. Using the same approach, we can also plot the metallurgical samples that we've already tested or that we propose to test in multivariate space and compare them to either the drill hole database or the resource block model if we have one. In this example, which is from a different project, we've plotted the multivariate block model grades in a two-dimensional UMAP coordinate system. We can see some of the natural grouping of the ore types and, and we can see that the coverage of the metallurgical samples, which are marked with the black crosses, relative to the data in the block model is good. The main clusters are reasonably well representative, re represented and we can say from this that we've done a good job with the metallurgical sampling and appear to have tested the main ore types. So to wrap up our little journey, if we step back a little, this diagram represents the basic path that we need to follow to ensure that our new discovery ultimately becomes a successful and profitable mining operation. Before a mine is established, the main source of data about all processing characteristics will come from the exploration drill hole samples and the metallurgical tests in a laboratory. By considering our drill hole data collection through a geometrical lens from the outset, we can make sure we maximize the opportunities to collect useful, good quality, low cost data during our drilling programs. We can make sure our metallurgical sampling covers the full range of ore types. And then we can join the drill hole data and the metallurgical data and develop predictive relationships using data analytics and machine learning. The predictive relationships can be applied to convert the resource block model to a geometrical block model containing estimates of things like metal recoveries, uh, power consumption, throughput, et cetera, et cetera. The geometrical model can now be used as an input to process plant design, project forecasting, and strategic optimization of our project. In terms of our understanding of the ore processing characteristics of the ore in three dimensions, we can use the data we've collected and the power of modern data analytics to advance from simple lithological ore type domain models to much more granular representations that provide a much stronger foundation for mine planning and optimizing our projects. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it interesting. I covered quite a lot of ground very quickly there, but I hope you found some useful takeaways. So we can take a few questions now, which you can chat, put into the chat bar. Uh, you're also very welcome to contact my, me by email if you'd like uh, a more in-depth discussion or additional information about any of those these topics. And you can see my email address on the screen now.